one of you wants to go first. Go ahead if you want, Seth. Oh, I can go first. Yeah, sorry. All right. Let me, uh, uh, whoop. Screen monitor, I think that's the right with the, um, all right. Oop. Shouldn't see that. And, oh, crap. My, uh, one second. My Terra Recon crashed. All right. Take me one second. So, all right. Let's, this is kind of a weird case that I wanted to show people um, and get your opinions on it. Um, never good at doing this with these. So this is a guy who um, had a really bad pneumonia. And, you know, you can see here, he's older gentleman, clearly has a very bad pneumonia. Um, this gets treated, uh, this is a few months later, and we can see that it's getting better. Um, you know, we're starting to see what in my mind is areas of organization where these airways are starting to dilate within the injured lung. Uh, we're seeing more peribronchiolar consolidation in the other areas, especially in the lingula and left upper lobe. Okay, that's normal response. You know, here we are now um, three months later. And, you know, to me, this is just kind of residual injury. So this thing is, was a bad hit to the lung, kind of like a, you know, it's not DAD because it's not the entire lung, but it's, it's that kind of injury. Um, and now this is, and you can see these other areas that we had here, the peribronchiolar consolidation lingula, that's resolved. We have some residual scarring. Okay. So be it. That's 2015. And that continues to decrease in density. And here we are in 2000 and um, 15, and this becomes his baseline. And again, just a bad a residual fibrosis from a bad pneumonia. Um, and, you know, it kind of looks like a healed bad lung injury. But what's weird is that a few years later, it starts to, um, well, this is 2017, looks the same. But then in 2018, just in that specific area, it becomes really quite dense again and becomes more consolidative. And that has remained now unchanged for another year. So we had a gentleman who seemingly had a bad pneumonia, which he did, that healed and then uh, resolved and then had for many years this stable appearing sequela of prior lung injury in that right upper lobe. But over the past two years, it's become very dense and consolidative again. And the airways have become more dilated. And it's just an odd, it's very pretty how you can see it sparing the fissure here. Um, but it's just a very odd pattern. I, I don't, it's not really a cool case in terms of a diagnosis because I don't know what the diagnosis is. Uh, I'm assuming the that lung has become re-injured again leading to this kind of pattern, but it's been stable for a couple of years. I, I don't know. Um, it just was a very odd thing I've never seen before where you have a patient and I wish I could somehow my terror recon skills. It looks like the extra pleural fat is thick and almost like you see with PPFE, you know, like there was some vascular injury. That's interesting. Let me see if I can get these all up in one so you can see the time course um, where it, uh, let's see if I can make this. And it's really pretty on the, unfortunately, this is not going to come across in any logical order. You would think it would put it into logical order based on the time, but it's not. Um, so this is kind of makes it a look, but this is the first, this is the second. And then he goes into this, you know, chronically healed process that stays like this for many years. And then all of a sudden, you know, four years later starts just becoming more dense and consolidated. And as you said, Travis, you know, with that volume loss, you start seeing the extra pleural fat being pulled in. I mean, you see that with bad fibrosis, you know, wherever it is, you even see that in IPF and stuff. So, but the pleural, there is pleural thickening there. Um, I, anyways, I, I don't know what to make of it. It was just a weird pattern. Well, of, you know, Seth? Yeah. 
one consideration is he could be getting an alveolar cell cancer in there. I'm sorry. Well, that was my to... that was my concern, but uh, you know, there was you know a prior documented bad pneumonia that was in that distribution that got better, and I I, I thought about that. He's like 88. Um, it hasn't changed in a year and a half since it's become more consolidative, but right. uh, given his age, I just kind of laid off of that a little bit, although it definitely did pop in my mind. Um, it, it, what I'm talking about is a scar carcinoma. Because he had the fibrosis, then, then he uh, has an increased rate of um, associated adenocarcinoma associated with the scarring process. So, you know, fibrosis complicated by scar carcinoma sort of thing. Yeah, but I thought the whole scar carcinoma thing was disproven. That in fact, it was the adenocarcinoma that itself creates uh, has, creates fibrogenic mediators that leads to the scarring itself, rather than carcinoma arising within a focus of scarring. It's the, oh. ad, it's the cancer that actually causes the scar. Well, first. the cancer can cause scar, but that doesn't mean that scar can't cause cancer. So it's not you know you can have both here. It's not what the one excludes the other. Now, I've seen several examples of scar carcinomas, the carcinoma arising in association with a pre-existing scar that was there you know, for a long time and, and wasn't caused by an early version of the cancer. So, and, you know, IPF has an increased rate of associated lung cancers. Yeah, no, any, right. any chronic inflammation or injury definitely increases your rate of cancer. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So that that might be what's going on here. And the other thing is they can be secondarily infected. So well, that's what I, yeah. that can take over here are things like um, you can even get ABPA and something like this or mycobacterial infection. So I, I just chalked it up to recurrent injury and it's more kind of just infected or inflamed from some recurrent injury. You know, the airways are still extremely dilated, like you would see with, a, you know, typical DAD kind of picture. Um, Although again, it's just very localized. But no, the the cancer thought definitely did cross my mind. I just didn't want to go there. And the gentleman. Well, let's, of, let's add of to that. Uh, let's add to that infection from, you know, aspergillus or um, mycobacteria in this part of the lung that can't keep itself clean. Yeah. All right. That's just an. And then this one is also very interesting and. Um, I'm never going to be able to get it to load in order because that's what this won't do. But this is uh, another very odd case. Let's see if I can get these loaded in some order. Give me a minute here. Because this is another thing I've never seen before, and it's another diffuse lung injury case, or not diffuse lung injury, another, uh, let me get the patients, the dates up here. So this is a patient. Did it put it up in order? Okay, it did, nice. Um, who has lupus? Okay, and um, she has this pattern of lung disease, and the other thing that's quite odd or bizarre is that I think most of us would look at this and see this, these little, I, I will put in parentheses, cystic change, because it's not cystic change, it's emphysema. We can see the small dot of the you know, pulmonary arterial sitting in the middle of this structure. This is um, clearly emphysematous change. Uh, so this is a young woman who has lupus. At this time, she's about 20. Um, and she's a never smoker. She's never touched a cigarette in her life. And as we watch this disease get worse and progress, you'll see not only does the emphysema, and it is emphysema because she underwent a biopsy, um, progress, but so does this kind of bizarre septal thickening. And as time goes on, um, this this just becomes more and more pronounced and what's interesting and this is i keep hitting the wrong buttons what's interesting about this i'll go to the current study so 
this is her current study. And um, the, the, and we, we see this in, not infrequently, and I will not this pattern, but this finding where we, this again, underwent biopsy. Biopsy just showed really, I, I'm having it re-reviewed because I didn't like the read. It just showed like chronic inflammation and lymph lymphocytes and germinal centers and a bunch of nonsense and then emphysema, extensive emphysema. But what's interesting with this is that if you notice the thing that is there, there is findings that would suggest a great degree of fibrosis here. And I was debating, you know, would I, would I call this honeycombing or not? Um, and the two things that are quite interesting, one, um, which I think most of you will agree with me, is that the amount of airway dilation or bronchiectasis associated with this degree of reticulation or reticular process is minimal. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, these airways are not normal, but they are definitely not being dramatically pulled apart or pulled uh, down. The other thing which is very interesting is that a lot of these quote unquote honeycomb spaces or cystic spaces, again, have the internal architecture and, and almost all of them, if you can look at them, have the internal architecture of secondary lobules. Um, and that these are not, remember honeycomb spaces theoretically are pathologically um, dilated distal airways, terminal bronchioles, or, and that what we should see is when we see honeycombing is no internal structures within the honeycomb cyst. They really are cystic spaces. They don't contain the pulmonary arterials associated with and other vascular, you know, structures of the secondary lobule. And again, even all these, if you really look at them, so the question is, what is this? And the other question I have for people is, what do you do when you see extensive bronchiectasis or what looks like extensive fibrosis in the absence of pronounced bronchiectasis? And then three, would you guys call this honeycomb or what would you call it? Well, one, has she gotten a genetic workup for, for stuff like Copa syndrome? Because that's what this kind of looks no like. Idea. I've never even heard of that before, man. It's it's one I've shown a couple of cases. One of our ILD guys here has has written up a collection of these, and they start as these kind of little holes in young patients, never smokers in their teens. I'll send you the article. I'd never heard of it either, but one of our ILD guys is is the genetics expert on it, COPA syndrome. But there's a lot. If she hasn't had a genetic analysis, I think she probably needs one. Yeah. Um, no. All but everything else you said, I totally agree with. I mean, all she has is like you know, has lupus and she underwent by She went to open, open lung biopsy and they talked about thickening of the interlobular septa, airway center inflammation and, you know, extensive emphysema and blah, 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 but no real. And uh, the lymphocytes, did you say there were lots of lymphocytes on that biopsy? Uh, I think they said germinal centers. So how about, how about, I mean, I've seen this sort of pattern with LIP before. So I wonder if she's got a, a little bit of a Sjogren's flavor to her SLE and whether this could really be. But you LIP. think, I mean, but you sure. would agree that these look more like emphysematous spaces. I think they're yeah. emphysematous spaces, but I think that the white stuff, the, um, you know, the septal thickening and all could be LIP. Oh, you're saying, okay. That, that does make, you know, you're right. Cause there are some forms, right. LIP, can you get a pronounced septal thickening? There are a few other nodules, um, <coughs> you know, peribronchial or things. That's actually a thought. Because the septal thickening is another thing I couldn't explain. There was really, um, if you go back prior to where before it became confluent, there's a lot of septal thickening. That's good uh, for LIP. It's, it's also good for amyloid. I presume they stain for amyloid. Probably not. Probably not, to tell you the truth. Um, the biopsy was done in like, uh, yeah, um, I, I doubt it. Let's put it that way. Uh, but that's, you know, I... I I thought amyloid crossed my mind, and I'm like, I have 20 amyloid in a 22 year old. I, I, I mean, even for this, I, I just haven't seen it in patients that young. Um, this is going to be a genetic thing. Yeah, but but the LIP thing that's a can, that's a good thought. Yeah. And can you, uh, Jeff, when he's done, can you switch to my screen really quick? I'll show you the paper. There's sure. Written from here. I mean, this is. Let's see. Uh, So would you guys call this honeycombing if you were coming across this de novo? I, I no. think I would hesitate. What? What do you say, David? I would hesitate to call that um, honeycombing. Holy crap, dude. It looks exactly the same. 
Yeah, look at C to D, and this is uh, these are young kids. Holy crap! It yeah. looks exactly the same, dude. And what is this it, called? Copa syndrome. It's called Copa syndrome. C O P A. Does she have any arthritis? Because a lot of these patients get joint symptoms. Because one of the patients I've like, seen. Um, I don't know, but she definitely has a. I mean, she's lupus, so she has some sort of um, right tissue disease, and we all know that there's a lot of overlap with stuff. So and here's the here's the histopath of the ten patients. You know, a lot of them have follicular bronchiolitis. Some of them have, and I think like getting this re-reviewed, the emphysema and whatever, is probably a good idea. Yeah, no, I, I had them pulled the, I think the biopsy was yeah. done in like 2002 or 2004, and I'm having them pull it so we can review it in a yeah. multidisciplinary conference. And I'm going to say this is clearly a case of COPA syndrome. <laughs> yeah, you can refer to the UCSF. Yeah, no, I think there's a paper from SUI. Um, yeah, SUI, <laughs> SUI at all, like Tony Shum's lab here. Yeah, no, seriously, it, that's, that's what this looks like. And and because I had the first one I had was a kid that was like diagnosed presumptively with JRA and before they even knew what this this mutation was. So what does it stand for? I don't know. Some sort of gene. The Copa gene. Yeah. Oh, well, you only have 14 cases. There you go. Travis? Only 14. Yeah. Travis, can you post this article? Can you send it to us all? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right, Jeff, uh, you can hand it back. I'll show my last quake case really quick. All right. Well, thanks. That's why it's always good to get these uh, things. You amazing. You get, all of our, you get all of our crazy vascular stuff down there. So send us your crazy ILD up here. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is a nice case of. Uh, and when I see this pattern, I really, to me, there's not much, there, there's only two things I really put in the differential diagnosis, even though it's a little bit broader than that, when I see this really avidly enhancing mass, and that there's a differential diagnosis for any avidly enhancing mass in the mediastinum. Um, but when I start seeing the parasitizing, to me, what I call parasitizing vessels and arteries coming from all over the place, coronary arteries feeding this thing, the number one thing I think of is a paraganglioma. You know, of course, you know, it could be theoretically Castleman disease. Uh, it doesn't look like a parathyroid adenoma. Yeah, vascular malformation, potentially, although I don't like it as much. To me, it really just looks like a paraganglioma. Um, so that's what I, someone showed this to me, and I said that that's what, um, uh, that's what this uh, likely is. And so that's what I told them, and they got a, uh, nuke med study, which showed it. But what was interesting is they got a MIBG scan and it's positive, but it's, let's see if I can get this through. It's only partially positive. So a lot of the tumor is not, doesn't uptake MIBG, but a small portion does. And I think that's why this patient might have been, and she doesn't really have hypertension. Um, and she's an older woman. She actually had a uh, carotid body paraganglioma removed um, about 20 years ago and was relatively asymptomatic for it. This is her, you know, in addition to the nuke med study, we recommended a urine urinalysis. And you can see that her, you know, levels of norepinephrine and uh, epinephrine are elevated, but not by any means dramatically. And, you know, I, and I, there are this kind of bimodal age distribution you see in paragangliomas, and it really is, I think, related to how hormonally active they are, how much catecholamines they release into the system. But I think this MIBG study kind of shows that, that, you know, even though there is some portion of the tumor that is, um, takes up a lot of MIBG, the majority does not. And I actually hadn't seen that before. Most of the MIBG scans I've seen done in patients are, you know, uniformly uh, show extensive uptake uniform throughout the lesion. So that was just an interesting case that um, we had, I think, a week or two so ago. What, what's the bimodal distribution of paragangliomas? I didn't realize that was... That you know, was patients who were, I say age, when I really, in the age, you see patients who present younger 20s, 30s, who have severe hypertension mm -hmm. um, and have more of the classic symptoms. And you see people who are in their 60s and 70s who are relatively asymptomatic who have you know mild hypertension, but not something that's too severe, 
and their urine catecholamines and um, ep, you know epinephrine or whatever are only mildly elevated. And so I've seen this with the you know 30 or 40 that I've reviewed at the ARP that you and the ones I've seen, you just see these very different populations, like the 20 year olds that are you know really uncontrolled hypertension and then your older patients who are relatively asymptomatic. Um, and I, I don't know if that, that might have, I know, but that's just what I've seen clinically and what I've, I think I've read that before, but I could just be making that up. Um, it's not the first thing I've made up, but it's uh, <laughs> definitely uh, a pattern I've seen. Cool. I don't know, has anyone else seen, I mean, I don't know, it's just a paraganglioma, it just has interesting do you think do you think Seth that part of it might be uh, might be infarcted and involuted or something like that? I wouldn't think so, given how the intensity of the uh, uptake within the lesion, the yeah, contrast there, enhancement. There, weren't there some calcifications in it, or were those just big vessels? Yeah, that, and that's not. Those are cal. There are some small areas of calcification, and I have seen that in in paragangliomas as well. Um, I and, if, that, if that goes along with some, uh, you know, some dead tissue there. Potentially, but the majority of it is, you know, actively enhancing. And I also don't think I've seen one extend through the AP window like this before. I, I know other people have shown them like this, and this is right smack dab in one of the parasympathetic ganglion that sits right on top here, right in the pretracheal region. So it's not an unreasonable location. I don't just don't know if I've seen one scoop through the uh, kind of AP window like that. But Anyways, I'm sorry I've taken a long time today, but those are uh, those are my cases. Thank you, Seth. Who is next? Okay, so um, let me I can just... go or David. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. For, thank you for calling. I'm sorry about I that. Talk about Travis. Travis. How many I serve? Okay. You see radiograph. Yep. So this is uh, an interesting. I mean, it's a quick case, but I think it's a good. Good reminder. This is a patient who came in cough, subjective signs case? of pneumonia, and this was at an outside hospital. And you know, this was picked up and said reasonably that it could be a pneumonia. They recommended follow up. Okay. Hopefully, you recognize on the PA okay, view, so and especially in older patients who have pneumonia, really? I always look for things so else they could be. And of course, you see here what wasn't detected at the time is this right paratracheal lymphadenopathy, and it looks a little full on the lateral view as well. So you know, while no harm came of this, I think if you recognize this at the time, probably too much for just a run of the mill of pneumonia and you're thinking more of post-obstructive pneumonia. And so it was picked up at this point, two months later when he got a repeat study as recommended. And you can see there's a little bit more consolidation here. Clearly looks like it's gonna probably be something post-obstructive and the right paratracheal lymphadenopathy has increased and no surprise, you can see the correlate on the CT done shortly after this huge nodes and this is not just pneumonia but it's obviously a cancer in the right upper lobe and this was subsequently proven as an adenocarcinoma so i think it's just a nice radiograph of you know always thinking about things that you know the fact that lung cancer can mimic pneumonia in a case like this let's see i'm gonna a couple of fairly related ones to that this one's kind of cool and this is a, a patient who as you can see here presented with fever and has left upper lobe consolidation. There's a little bit of volume loss. It looks like it could be some degree of left upper lobe atelectasis, although not a ton of volume loss. And he also had acute symptoms. Uh, but what wasn't recognized at the time on the radiograph is this, which was kind of just, you know, I think just thought to be overlying, but of course it corresponds perfectly to the location of the left bronchus on the PA and the lateral view. So it looks like a foreign body here. He's had no surgeries in the past and you see probably some necrosis here. So what's interesting about this is that it is a post-obstructive pneumonia and you can see he's got probably just some bronchiectasis that's chronic. And this actually turned out to be a push pin when they took it out, causing the post-obstructive collapse of his left up, post-obstructive pneumonia slash atelectasis of his left upper lobe. And they, on questioning, he apparently aspirated or thought he swallowed a push pin eight years ago. And it wasn't until you know, the last month that he actually presented with symptoms. 
So presumably this had been in there for eight years and then now caused his post-obstructive atelectasis. And it's also just interesting that it ended up in his left upper lobe since that's a pretty unusual location to aspirate. You know, unless he's lying on his left side swallowing push pins. I don't know. What's a push pin? Was, is that like a thumbtack? Oh, yeah, thumb yeah. yeah, a little thumbtack type of thing. I don't see the plastic that you put on the end of a thumbtack. They call it push pin. I don't know what it is. <laughs> you can see here, they, the, the, the pathologist called it a push pin. Is it damp for tomorrow? But, but um, yeah, it was like eight years ago that he, he thought he inhaled um, it. So. But that one is visible on the radiograph. So again, always looking for, for foreign bodies is important. This one just came in a couple of days ago. And this is a lady who had sudden onset of odinophagia and had a chest radiograph. You know, it doesn't look too bad here. We'll come back to it in a second. They went straight to endoscopy and found something jutting out of her esophagus. And before they removed it, they went to CT. And in this case, you can see that there is some inflammation of her proximal esophagus. And here is something that looks metal. When you window it, it's not quite as dense as the other thing that we saw. It's a little, got a little beveled appearance. And this ended up being, they, after this, they went in and removed it. You know, it's close to, but not involving the aorta. And this actually ended up being a chicken bone fragment that this lady, she didn't know she had aspirated or, or swallowed, but it, we don't know when. But I think the difference between metal and bone, I. There's no no clue of this on the on the radiograph that I can see. I don't know if you guys can see anything. It should be just above the level of the aortic arch, but I mean, I'd say good luck seeing anything here. But um, yeah, it's just kind of an interesting run of foreign bodies that we've had recently. So, mm -hmm. so that turned out to be a chicken bone. Let's see. This one. This is kind of just a curiosity. This came in the other day. I've got a whole slew of temporal studies on this. This is a patient who is 67 years old and came in after a fall and had back pain. And they did an aorta, the CT aorta, so we did non-con and, and post-con. She doesn't have any trauma, but I noticed something which I don't think I've ever noticed before, which is calcification in the central canal. And this is presumably of the dura. What is also interesting, you see she has a dialysis fistula but she also has what looks like a porcelain left atrium. She's had a mitral valve replacement and that was a long time ago. I don't know actually why she had the mitral valve replaced, but the dural calcification I thought was interesting. And I saw the dialysis fistula. So I wondered when, if she was on dialysis and wondered how long this has been here. Like if she had had lapiodol injection or something in the past that just stayed around. And I was able to go back. So she had her, her nephrectomies in like 2012 because of TC uh, transitional cell carcinoma. And that's when she ended up on dialysis. And you can see back in 2009, she had a mitral valve, but she had no porcelain left atrium, nor did she have any sort of calcification of her dura. And then there's some, you know, in 2015, this was after her nephrectomy, she's starting to develop a little bit of it, you can see here. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before. I assume it's just related to dialysis and and abnormal calcium phosphate and deposition. I was talking so, to the neuro, one of the neuro folks. They had never noticed that. They they did say that she has typical calcification of her ten, uh, tentorium that you often see in dialysis patients, especially. Uh, but you know, and I couldn't really find much in the literature. I found one article of two cases from the neurosurgery literature with neural calcification, but I don't know. It seems the temporal relationship seems to fit. Travis, so you're identifying this dural calcification in the spinal canal. I'm sorry, I missed the earlier yeah. part. Of the phone call. Yeah. Okay. Dural. Yeah. Have you ever seen that, David? No, but I don't. I don't think I've actually looked in that area often enough. So, um, we just had we had a case this week, and I didn't have time to get it ready to present today. But it's a person who developed these bizarre big blobs of calcium in the lung. In the left lung base and it turned out that this all developed after he'd had a liver transplant and then was he had infection for a while and he went into acute uh, renal failure and thereafter this this lung consolidation turned turned bright white uh, and deposit a lot of calcium and it, I believe it's the abnormal calcium product 
a kind of metastatic slash dystrophic calcification yeah. in this um, in this inflamed lung related to the renal failure. But yeah, I thought this was just kind of kind of cool. And yeah, the neuro attending I showed it to had never seen that before either. But they thought that made sense since you can see it in the tentorium, but also the the porcelain left atrium after she went on dialysis as well. Travis, did the aorta, the aorta is kind of dense too. Did it also change after dialysis? Good question. Let's see. Yeah, here's the old one. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I think it's just calcium. And actually, look her at her, pulmonary look arteries look too. At her, uh, air, her airway cartilage or airways are calcified too. Yeah. And, and her pulmonary arteries. I didn't even notice that until just now. Well, yeah, she's just calcifying everything. But interestingly, her, you know, her, she does not have metastatic pulmonary calcification in her lungs. No calcium left. <laughs> Yeah. So very interesting. That's cool. But yeah, and David, I will admit I don't use I don't look at the spine that often either, but it was a history of trauma, like evaluate for T spine injury or anything. So I feel like I've seen it before and never thought much of it. Uh, but I'll have to start looking. We we do a fair number of yeah. years, so I'll have to start looking for it. And I will I will at least finish now with this case. I've got a couple more I can show if there's time. I've never seen this in an adult before. You can see that it looks like shunt vascularity. You've got a big pulmonary artery. You've got big central yeah. arteries. They kind of prune peripherally. I don't have a lateral view. And this is a patient with, with a known history of unrepaired congenital heart disease. They're not from around here. They actually presented with a stroke. And actually, I'll just show that first. And you can see that they have an abscess, which patients that have unrepaired shunts are certainly at risk for since the lung isn't filtering out the bacteremia, and it can end up in systemic circulation. As I've shown on many cases, I always like looking at the timing series, and you can see here that injection in the SVC and the aorta and the pulmonary artery are simultaneously lighting up. So she's got some, or he's got some sort of mixture. And Seth, I'll be curious if you've ever seen this in an adult, but as you scroll down, you can see superior vena cava, everything's just dumping into the left atrium, or a lot of it is. And you can see there's a big right coronary artery and there's this big fatty bar between the right atrium and the right ventricle and a big septal defect. So this is unrepaired tricuspid atresia in an adult who is not on oxygen and hasn't seen a cardiologist in 15 years. According to the note that the parents elected not to have this repaired when the child was a kid and now only presented because of this brain abscess. So. I don't yeah. Know. Can you scroll up higher? Let me see. What is the pulmonary circulation? Oh, she's yeah. got this. He's got this weird branch to his right or left lower lobe pulmonary artery too. You can see how it kind of comes off high and medial, and then swoops down to some of the segmental vessels because there's weird. this is some of the right lower or left lower lobe, and then it's like to the to the posterior medial basal segments. It's like a separate artery that twists off of there. But, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, he's not. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a. It's, it's just a complete admixture heart. I mean, it's a single atrium, yeah. single. Um, and yeah. It's, and then yeah, ASD and VSD, which is how stuff's getting to the pulmonary circulation, since there's yeah. tricuspid atresia. He's just okay living at a low oxygen. <laughs> yeah. Percentage. So, yeah, and then he's got the the usual pulmonary arterial hypertension look in his lungs. And, yeah. and he may actually have a little bit of, I don't know if he's got a bronchial atresia up here, probably. In fact, actually he does. I didn't even look at that before. It looks like there's probably with that hyperinflation up here. So at least several different developmental abnormalities. So, so we could add that to our collection of unrepaired congenital heart disease in, the, in adult patients. Yeah, I had a... Yeah, I saw one just the other day. It was pretty nuts. But this, I've not seen this one before. No. Travis, the uh, the lung texture is really good for uh, plexiform arteriopathy, including yep. the little little ground glassy smudges, but also the little little aneurysms of the distal arterioles. You know, so, suddenly you're in the center of the lobule, suddenly it gets big. Yeah, and, so, and the li like kind of corkscrew, and then they dilate in some areas. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jeff. All right, thanks. I'm going to turn over to you, Brian. There we go. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, excellent. So uh, I got a couple cases uh, this week. Um, 
Uh, they're both uh, left atrial uh, esophageal fistula, result uh, from uh, atrial ablations. Um, actually, I came from the same AP lab. Um, the first was this lady who uh, came in, had a history of prior pulmonic valve repair in infancy, um, and developed pulmonic valve endocarditis. And she'd had this left atrial um, uh, ablation about eight months prior, and then a dental procedure uh, three months prior to, to a presentation, and presented with um, uh, infection of her pulmonic valve, and then also um, multiple embolic strokes. And you can see this um, gas and fluid filled structure within the left atrium um, right in front of the esophagus. Um, there, um, you can see they uh, they do a transeptal puncture during the the ablations. Um, there's a, a strand of tissue going into the right atrium, and then they kind of lose it. But there's probably some going across the tricuspid valve as well. Um, this is what it looks like on the non-con. Not, not a whole lot different. We did an esophagram, um, and it did not fill in the esophagram. And at the time of surgery, they found a, a hole in the the left atrium, um, right 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 here, right next to the esophagus. Um, this second guy um, presented relatively how, more how, acutely. How far out did you say they were? So from uh, the ablation? she was about six to eight months out from the ablation, um, and then she, uh, and then three months prior to presentation, she had a dental procedure. Um, so we probably have a cumulative of ten of these, and like in the literature, it's usually, you know, on the order of weeks to a month. I've, that's crazy protracted presentation yeah i think that's yeah, we, also one of the larger ones we've seen usually it's like a little wisp of yeah. gas or a bubble yeah i've never seen one that big yeah it's like so, a hot um, air balloon <laughs> um yeah i guess one one thing we were thinking was whether or not uh the injury sealed off relatively quickly during the procedure um because we couldn't show any actual extravasation or uh, enteric contrast going into this um, and yeah, and then maybe it, it got, it just became a, a nidus for infection after her dental procedure. And, and then she presented with those embolic phenomena. Um, and then the second guy, um, he presented two or three months after his procedure. And he, I think he's got more of a typical appearance. He's got a couple of loculoles of gas um, that don't quite look like they're in the, esoph in the esophagus. Um, and he was actually transferred here with a much more compelling story. Um, he was uh, neurologically altered. Um, and they were getting ready to do an LP, and he had a, a bright red hematemesis. Um, and so uh, both of these were proven um, uh, at surgery to be uh, left atrial um, defects caused by the, likely from the ablations. Yeah, because yeah, usually it isn't a full thickness injury from the ablation, that it just, the thermal injury causes inflammation, and for whatever reason, a fistula develops later. Mm. Yeah, that's... These are two of the better cases we've ever seen. You go back to the first one, you'd almost wonder if it was like a hernia of the esophagus into the atrium through it. Because, I mean, how would, I'm just trying to, I mean, that thing clearly looks walled off. Yeah, it's just a mix of, of air and thrombus and. Yeah, it's just. I mean, that, the, the the portion that's going through the septum into the right atrium is just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's like an I mean, we probably, we can probably dig up 15 of these. I've always wanted to write them up. These are two of the nicer ones, if anybody yeah. wants to help. Oh, yeah. yeah we uh, we were quite surprised. They, these, these came in uh, within two weeks of each other. <laughs> so we're waiting for the third. Where, where's the esophageal lumen on this cross section here? Can, can you help me add right back there? Intimate. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 def it's right back there. And on on the second guy, we were able to obtain the um, the fusion from the time of the ablation, and uh, and no, um, you know, they showed that um, pretty much the maximal energy deposit was right right here, yeah. right next to the uh, uh, the defect. And and of they course, these always happen right along the ostea, since that's where they do the the procedure. Cool. All right. Thanks. David, do you have a case? Uh -huh. It looks to me as if there's a big inflammatory mass there. So um, I'm wondering if the delayed presentation was really that there was there was an abscess and the abscess eventually eroded into the um, into the um, left atrium. Because I thought on that on that last on the last picture, I could actually see the esophagus 
more medial, near just in front of the spine, not where that big pad of tissue was. Um, so there, there's, I mean, I think there's more than just esophageal wall there. I think there's extra tissue a la inflammation. Hmm. <laughs> David, do you have cases? Uh, I couldn't get two of them today. I'm sorry. That's okay. All right. I will. Oh, so just, just a quick thing. There is a bimodal age distribution of paragangliomas, but it's not based on, um, just reading all these papers, it's, it's not actually based on, it is based on hormone uh, secretion, but it's mostly based on the presence of concomitant, concomitant uh, genetic abnormalities and like MEN syndrome and von hippel lindau and all that stuff. So that, that's the reason for the bimodal age distribution. Got it. Um, okay. Anyways, I digress from what I said. All right, so <laughs> this is a case um, that, that with some incidental findings. This was a CT done for a dilated ascending aorta, which you can see that there's the aorta. And what was interesting is, let's look at these uh, cardiac veins. So if we follow the great cardiac vein down right here, you'll notice, and this guy was in the 60s, no symptoms from this. You see this draining into the left atrium. And then as we go down, you'll see there's this vessel, looks like the part of the coronary sinus here. Um, but if you go further down, you'll see that it seems to communicate with the left ventricle, sort of at the undersurface of the heart there. Um, and you see contrast density makes it look like that. So um, sort of a variant unroofed coronary sinus, but I mean, right there. But I, have you guys ever seen anything like this? With the communication of a, I mean, like a ventricular venous fistula. Is is it also communicating with the right atrium or not? Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. if you look at the differences in contrast. Yeah. You don't really see a jet of denser stuff. There seems to be contained. You right. don't have any additional imaging on him. Sort of a there was just a dilated. Yeah, well, like right there, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of connection with the with the right atrium right okay. there. Right here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's that's the cardiac guys. <laughs> huh. But, yeah, it's but, weird. Uh, it's sort of a you know a variant of the, you know, the Oh wait, it connects to the left atrium and then goes into the yeah, is it where the middle is it where yeah. the middle in, the, inferior yeah, ventricular yeah, vein comes out? Yeah, right there. That's the yeah, in, there's the vein and it comes up yes. the, like sort of oh, that's uh, I haven't and seen that before. communicates that's with the left ventricle. So Jeff? Yeah. Jeff, this thing seems to have the same contrast attenuation as the uh, as the lumen of the left ventricle. Where yeah, is the that's blood what I'm thinking is right, right there. Thing? It's communicating with it, presumably right yep. here. So, so this thing is filling retrograde. Then it's it's blood is coming out of the left ventricle and it's going into this vein, and then it's right. then it's then up up along the left atrium. And if you look, the uh, yeah, the veins are pretty dense here, considering um, you know. We but they're not big, so uh, it must be compressing right into the left atrium from right. the, it must be going from left uh, ventricle into the left atrium via that route. It's interesting that the left atrium isn't that big. You'd think this would be, there'd be enough volume, amount of maybe not enough to be volume overloaded. Huh, Purely that's weird. Panel finding. Yeah, I thought it was weird too. the right shot because nope. we're filling the systemic vein from, um, True. You know, it's not pushing. It wasn't. It wasn't pushing blood back into the coronary artery, there, was it? Uh, probably not. No, I don't yeah, know. No ischemic symptoms at all. Uh, yeah. So Jeff, I know I've shown a case of just the great cardiac vein as it wraps around, draining straight into the left atrium, but never with this other weird right, right. ventriculoatrial connection of the middle cardiac vein. I've never seen. Can the higher towards the PA again. Was there something? Higher up, keep going up, keep going, keep going. What that's is there a little that's a cold something? Cold. Cold. But is it coming out of the P? Am I being no, faked I think, out there? Yeah, I think it's you're just catching it coming over. Oh, like right here. Oh, and then no, I, we're oh, right there. This conal brain. I thought I saw it, I thought I saw it coming out of the, the uh, left wall of the PA, but I guess I'm making that up there. I don't know where it's coming from. It's, it's denser than the PA, though. Yeah. I just saw that flashing up, just caught my eye real quick. Yeah. We don't get much, we don't see the rest of it there. And then there's the, you know, coronaries are normal size, just a little plaque, but yeah, it's just weird. I don't know. All right. Um, this is, uh, I know we've seen one of these before. So this was a, 
uh, middle-aged woman presented with this mass. And you can see there's a big mass in the left lung with some high level lymph node enlargement. And on the, um, where's the lateral? Here's the lateral. You can see it filling in down inferiorly there. So here's the CT. And if I recall, she was a, she was not a smoker. Um, but, you know, big hyalur mass and then sort of into the lower lobe. So this was resected. And the reason I'm showing this is the pathology. This came back as a, as one of those uh, nut, what they used to call nut midline, now it's a nut carcinoma, which um, nuclear protein and testis, it's a translocation. And they're, they're rare in the lung. Uh, I just, when I looked it up a little bit, there's only a few reports, but it's a, uh, it's a very aggressive tumor. Um, they don't, they don't necessarily have good outcomes, but they, originally most of them occur along midline structures. And it's a, it's a, the nut, whatever gene or whatever is something that's seen in germ cells. Uh, so they, they can grow rapidly and differentiate the things. But I think, was it you, Travis, who showed one of these? H Howard has seen the most. He's shown uh, two or three of them. I've, I've shown one or two, but oh. I've not seen it in the yeah. lung. Our pathologist was excited about it, I think, just because it was a rare tumor, but it's not a, um, there's nothing specific about the imaging, um, other they tend to be younger patients and they're, they can very, be highly, very young. High, highly aggressive tumor. Yeah. All right. Um, and I don't have any of the images of it. Um, now I can't remember if I showed this case. Did I show you guys this airway collapse case or not? I've shown it for other reasons. That's why I can't keep it straight, but I don't think I have. Um, but this is, or did I, do you remember? I'm guessing no, because nobody said anything. So this is a patient with some central airway uh, symptoms, and you can see on inspiratory CT, the trachea has a normal configuration. The um, bronchi look good. There's not much going on. There's a little stuff in the left lower lobe um, and all that. But we did a dynamic expiratory scan uh, concurrently, and you can see there's just almost coaptation of the posterior wall with the cartilage, but the cartilage itself is relatively, I mean, it's intact. It hasn't bowed or flattened out. And as you go down to the carina, it's pretty tight there as well. So, and then um, bronchial medius is gone too. So a case of excessive dynamic airway collapse. And then here are the minips, so the inspiratory, you know, the sagittal minips are the best. So this is an inspiratory trachea. It looks perfectly normal. And expiratory, the entire intrathoracic component just collapses down to severe narrowing. So this is to be distinguished from tracheobronchomalacia where you get softening of the cartilage. Now they can coexist, but uh, I think the important thing is, is you can, you will not appreciate this diagnosis or even consider it on inspiratory imaging because the trachea looks normal. And I don't know what her underlying cause was. Um, you know, it's, um, I've seen people with recurrent infections or people with bronchiectasis stuff, but you know, other than a little scar in her left lower lobe, uh, she doesn't really have much going on. So there may be some... Sorry, why wouldn't you call this trachea bronchomalacia? I mean, it's dynamic collapse, why? So it's excessive dynamic airway collapse um, because the, the, the malacia implies weakness of the cartilage, but her cartilage is normal. So it's just the posterior membrane that's abnormal. It's weakened, it's redundant, but at inspiration, it's, it's propped open. Whereas if you see people with bad tracheomalacia, they often will have a lunate shape or they'll bow outward um, their, um, their, their cartilage. So it loses its C shape. It becomes more of like a, like a half moon, yeah, yeah. A, a rainbow or a hyperbola or something. And then you see at expiration, the trachea maintain, the cartilage is intact. It doesn't, it doesn't collapse. Whereas the membrane is, is, is too, too mobile. And so it, it, it almost it, it here it co-ops with the posterior wall. It, it moves too far. And so the, but they're probably similar symptomatic. Oh, absolutely. Symptom and functionally, okay. and functionally they're identical, but the treatment's very different because they're. Uh, I think the Beth Israel in Boston they have the biggest experience with this, but they can do a tracheoplasty. They can sort of buttress or reinforce this posterior wall. I don't know if they resect it exactly, but they can put a mesh or something something in there to keep this from happening. Whereas if you have weakened cartilage, if it's long segment, there's really nothing you can do short of a stent. Huh. Often stent yeah. is a trial to see if the symptoms improve. And if, if it's just an EDAC case, then there may be a role for tracheoplasty. Seth, I just forwarded you an article that Howard had sent out when we had this discussion a couple years ago. 
because I didn't realize there was a distinction either and was incorrectly just interchangeably using yeah, those terms. I learned, we, we, we all learned it as tracheal malacia, but the uh, interventional uh, pulmonologists make the distinction specifically because they're, 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 the treatment is different. But you're right, the physiology, it shows a central expiratory obstructive loop and uh, patients cough like crazy and they don't like to lie flat. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's so our, our surgeon here has made makes the same distinction. We used to call this like redundant posterior membrane or flaccid posterior membrane and stuff like that. Um, and uh, he he trained at Harvard, so maybe that's where he picked up on these distinctions. <laughs> ah, sorry, I don't know what I just did here. There we go. You hit this bar. Yeah. All right. So this case is just a radiograph case. Um, this is an older patient who reportedly has a history of asbestos exposure, and this is. Um, I have a couple of questions, and it's particularly interesting what David thinks since he's seen uh, occupational stuff for a long time, but has this extensive bilateral fibrothorax. We can see there's pleural thickening and calcification, uh, but there's really you know, unusual apical calcification. You see the apical thickening, but there's also this dense calcification, which to me, maybe it's parenchymal, but maybe it's sitting on the visceral pleura given the extra pleural tissues. And I've not seen that with asbestos and Chris and I were talking about that today too. And it's really not discrete plaque. There may be a few, but this is really diffuse pleural thickening, which doesn't necessarily mean this is all asbestos related. And this apical stuff makes me think of other things, but you know, as far as I knew, there was no, there's no history of empyema, trauma, other things that we might think of, rheumatoid arthritis. So I don't know. If you think maybe this is unrelated and this is age-related stuff, but and this is just diffuse pleural thickening, you can even see it along paraspinal mediastinal interface there. Right. So the, the apical stuff I think is really independent of the whole asbestos problem in this person. Okay. Um, and I've I've seen that as an isolated thing, and sometimes the the lung nearby is perfectly normal. It's a it's a very thin arc often, it just doesn't look that um, scarred up. And I think it just I think you know I I thought maybe there's some ischemia at that at that tissue in the lung apex or trauma from the lung hanging from it for many years it usually is in old people and it's unaccompanied by anything else so I think that there's some dystrophic effect on that tissue up there and often you'll get these thin arcs of calcium calcium now his is not thin particularly on his left it's uh kind of lumpy right. but I don't think it has anything to do with uh with this stuff elsewhere, except okay. that he's old. Okay. Yeah, I've seen the thinner calcifications before. It's just given the, the how chunky it was, it was a little unusual. But yeah, if you took that think, away, I'd be happy with this being fibro diffuse pleural thickening calcification. But I think uh, Jeff, I think you know, he's got a very discrete calcification along his right hemidiaphragm, and that's almost certainly an asbestos plaque. Mm -hmm. And so I think that he's got over here plaque, and he has diffuse pleural thickening both calcified uh, and probably from asbestos. Okay. Uh, yeah. so this, is a, this is one of those unusual cases of um, diffuse pleural thickening from asbestos. And it's accompanied by the classic pleural plaque, which is different from diffuse. Yeah, it's interesting. I was in this chart, he had, they, the, I don't have any cross-sectional imaging, but he carries a diagnosis of asbestosis, but I, I don't see anything that I could necessarily convince myself of and it's been a long time and it should not just hang out for right. decades. Okay. So people use, people use asbestosis loosely to include pearl plaques a lot, a lot of times it's just not used very carefully. Correct. Okay. Um, I will stop there. It's three o'clock but yeah thank you David that's very helpful. Okay guys well thanks. I'll thanks everyone. Later.